up. All you ever ask for is an opportunity. You got it today. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? The Rock Pile Report with Buffalo Bills season ticket holder, Drew Gear. Be aggressive. You have literally nothing to lose. You're a borderline football team. If I don't keep laughing about this stuff, my teeth are going to turn around and devour my brain. The Bills make me want to While Williams is considered below average in terms of height and weight, standing at six foot four and 302 pounds, it's his technique that makes him so good. He has excellent footwork and can execute almost every single block with good form. In my opinion, the way he combines his excellent balance with good hand placement is the big reason that will make him an instant starter at the next level. Looking at Williams as a pass blocker, he is balanced through his kick slides. He comes out of his stance with ease and he is ready for almost every move a defensive lineman has to offer. He lands his punches with good placement, and he mirrors well allowing to stall a pass rusher in their path. As a run blocker, he also showed that same level of prowess. He has underrated power, and he gets slow driving with his legs on combo blocks. He also used that same hand placement to transfer force into a defender. In my opinion, his quickness and footwork to execute reach blocks, and his understanding of angles and positioning allowed him to make his blocks with ease. Everybody to another edition of the Rock Pile Report Podcast. I am your host, Bill Season Ticket Holder Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger, and that was Sam Gold, film analyst for The Athletic, talking about one of my favorite prospects of the offensive line class, Jonah Williams. And we will link to his uh, video in the description of the show if you need to catch up on some Jonah Williams tape. Oh, my God. I, I'm in love with this prospect, and I'm in love with the idea of offensive line. Folks, we have yet another packed show for you guys tonight. We've got Draft Talk with Russ Brown. We've got uh, over, from over at Cover1.net. He's one of their national scouts. We've got just we've got a lot here to talk about. But first and foremost, I want to kick things off and say thank you to everybody who showed up to Potathon this weekend in support of the BB&G Charities. It was a great time. I got to meet up with a bunch of listeners Meet a lot of great, just hang out with a lot of great people. You know, Del Reed was there, the train wreck sports guys, and I drank more than my fair share. I know that. Chris. Well, Nate gave me a gift card to Picasso's Pizza for having the best hair at the bar. I think, he, Chris, the be- best hair. This is how delusional you are. He literally handed it to you and said, Chris, here's $25 to Picasso's. Now use that money to get a haircut. I mean, I have amazing <laughs> hair as is. Oh so, my god! I mean, god. I don't know what he was talking about, folks. Beer, a lot of different, just a lot of personalities in the same room, a lot of sports talk. I don't know where the hell else you'd rather be. It was a really cool experience, and I really look forward to the next one, which is apparently coming soon in October. I, but it's hard for me to focus on the future with any sort of positivity because right now I'm slowly being consumed by dread. But I'm nervous, Bills fans. No, not about the fact that the draft is getting closer or that it's giving me anxiety. I'm going on a cruise. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic boy, the boy, this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailor man, skipper brave and sure. My passenger set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. This is not a three-hour tour, Chris. And I swear to God, if it ends the same way that Gilligan's Island did, I am going to snap. I've already informed my wife. Folks, I'm not afraid of travel. And I'm certainly not a high-maintenance human being. Okay, I, I've... St- I've stayed everywhere from some of the cheapest resorts that you can find, some of the cheapest hotels you can find, to some of the nicest resorts that Jamaica and Mexico have to offer. Five-star places. I mean, Chris, places that are so nice, I'm literally uncomfortable to be in them. I had no idea that you could go to Jamaica and Mexico and find a Howard Johnson's. (laughs) And yet, with all of my travel, I've never set foot on a cruise ship before. And I've actively spent 33 years refusing to do so. And can you blame me? I mean, think about that there's so much to hate about the concept of a cruise, right? Here's some facts, Chris. Here's some facts that I've dug up in my research of this. In the month of December 2017, 332 passengers of Royal Caribbean cruises contracted some form of gastrointestinal illness. 
A single 3,000-person cruise ship can carry 150,000 gallons of sewage. And those septic systems are shit. Chris, those toilets don't flush. With what your body produces, I feel for all those passengers. And according to Cruise Lines International, 19 people per year go overboard on a cruise ship. I mean, you going on a cruise reminds me, I mean, Bill Burr is one of our favorite comedians. And he has, if you don't know Bill Burr, he's got a bit about how to el- eliminate <laughs> the population, like reduce, br- the, reduce population. the population by sinking cruise ships. Just have the government just randomly start sinking cruise because ships. Because you'll be taking out the dregs of society. Let's face it. Let's face it. I mean, and then there's my own personal nonsense if you want to mix it into things. I mean, I seem like a pretty decent guy so long as the bills aren't playing. People seem to agree that I'm I'm a pretty congenial guy, but I despise crowds, especially crowds of people. I mean, a perfect example of this, I can't sleep on airplanes. Not because I'm afraid of being 20,000 feet in the air or the concept of plummeting to my death. I mean, hey, if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Just, just hit something hard. I don't want to limp away from this piece of shit. I just can't shake the feeling that somewhere on, a, on any given flight... There's someone who's either strongly considering or is already actively doing something stupid. And I don't want their stupidity actively impacting me. So I feel compelled to stay awake and monitor everyone around me. (laughs) Call that paranoia. Call it what you want. I can't sleep on planes. So now here's three hours I'm losing of my life. Three hours that I'm just going to be awake and irritated for. And then there's what I like to call the Griswold effect. I'm a gear. And we have a running joke in our family that we all might as well be the Griswolds from the various vacation films. Because whenever we try to travel or plan anything together as a family activity, something absolutely goes wrong. Chris, that's been the story of my life for three decades. My very first flight at the age of five, trying to fly home from Seattle, Washington, got snowed in and we had to stay in a hotel. I got stuck in the Newark airport for six hours because I was flying to Vegas the day the miracle on the Hudson happened. And then on the flight, because hilariously enough, the plane's AC shit out just before takeoff, I found out that air marshals actually exist. Those are real people because of a shoving match between me and one of my buddies who was sweating all over me during the flight. (laughs) Okay, that's a thing. On the way back home from Mexico a few years ago, I had a three-hour layover at the Cleveland airport turn into eight hours and the promise of a free drink on board at 12.45 a.m. because every rental car was gone in the airport and the airline somehow lost our pilot. How do you lose a pilot? Where did they go? Was he abducted by aliens? Was he just drunk at a bar? The world will never know. And then, Chris, the last trick I, the trip I took during last year's draft to Jamaica, the airport lost my luggage, and yet no one working in the international department could tell me what the hell the protocol was. Do I stay here and do I have to be present when my bag comes in from a foreign country known for illicit substances? Do I have to be here in case you, I mean, do I have to spell that out for them why they might want me on premises when my bag shows up? No one can give me a straight answer. And so, in the end, I almost ended up missing my connecting flight. And in the process, almost, I was a person of interest, according to TSA. They followed me through the rest of the terminal because apparently I have what they call an explosive temper. (laughs) Shocking, right? You do have explosive temper face. (laughs) So, Chris, who knows what's going to happen? You're sending me out to sea? Chris, this might be the last you ever see of me. All right, guys. Rockpile Report 716 Send me your audition tapes to be the new host <laughs> of the Rockpile Report. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say this, guys. I mean, I'm going to be surrounded by people. I'm picturing whenever I try to go into the pool, somebody somebody with a George the Animal Steel back hair is going to be trying to give me the Along Came Polly treatment just right up against the face. It's There's a lot of this that, to me, just is my nightmare. Okay? <laughs> I don't know that I've been this worried about taking a vacation before. And I know that if anything is going to get me through, it's going to be the love that I have for my wife. And (laughs) alcohol. My my interest in seeing her have a good time. My gorilla-esque charm. 
and alcohol. Copious amounts of alcohol. Now, hopefully they're as good as the beer that we're about to sample during tonight's show. One of our faithful listeners, Kyle Washington out of Nevada. I mean, Kyle, huge, thank you so much because you didn't have to do that. He was kind enough to send us, knowing I'm a fan of craft beer, he sent us a smorgasbord of regional craft beers from all over Nevada and the Northwest. And we're going to crack open one of his favorites tonight and test it out. Tonight, it's Acropolis by Lead Dog Brewing. It's a double IPA. Heavy boy. So you have a double boner tonight. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> you love IPAs. I Cheer- just, cheers I just to pour- you, Kyle. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do. Ooh. It's got a very hoppy scent to it. Oh, it I'm, should. Mm. I mean, you just went for it. I oh. I just smelled it, and you're like, oh, I'm going to drink this. i got to get right in here. Mm. See, yeah. now that's smooth. For a double IPA, the High Gravity Boys, this is nice. I like this. Mm. Oh, it's got requisite hops, yet it finishes kind of clean. I like it. Usually the, uh, the aftertaste of an IPA annoys me. This is not that bad. Oh, Chris, not that bad. You're sw- oh, you, you call me a peasant. You have the... T- oh. well, I, I'd like to just stick to ales and lager, but I'm not a beer guy. I'm not a beer guy to begin with, but when I... You're going to give me a beer, give me this an ale, very, give me a lager. What I like about this is the hops are kind of hazy. The taste is kind of fluid. It rolls right off the tongue. It's a really easy drinking beer for 7.5% alcohol. I like this. Yeah, this does go down very easy. Chris, and that's coming from a guy who doesn't even like IPAs. Kyle, you knocked it out of the park with this one. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, your uh, your other beers that you sent us that will sample in the oh, weeks we are going to gonna come, be rolling through these. Better be as good. But better be. You shut your mouth. You are a peasant in the, in the world of beer tasting. I love it. Absolute home run. And with that, we're going to jump right into this week's Bill's News Update. <music> Amongst a whole bunch of activity over at One Bill's Drive in the last couple days, there's one that just sticks in my craw. They announced the re-signing of Eddie Yarbrough at defensive end. And then today, they announced the signing of NFL veteran Eli Harold at defensive end. So that gives us six DNs on the roster. In fact, I, is that six or is that seven? I don't even know. But the fact remains, both of those guys are guys with NFL experience who matter in terms of roster building. And yet then there's one that seems to have gotten a lot of press in the last 48 hours that I can't wrap my head around. I open Twitter up on my lunch on Monday, and I see all sorts of conversation about the Bills being assigned a European rugby player named Christian Wade as part of some international development program. He apparently led his league over there in tries, which is the rugby term for crossing the goal line. And was he's be, Chris, he's being talked about by many as a quote-unquote incredible athlete. I don't know what the fuck that means in terms of the NFL. He's trying to make it here as a running back slash special teams player. That's not going to happen. Chris, I, I'm not trying to be rude, but I blew past the story with nothing but a shrug when I first read it because I said, oh, well, that's that's a blip on the radar. And yet I had to listen to some people, some people who I value their opinions or at least view them as somewhat intelligent when it comes to sports, continue filling up the air with talk about this guy, about the what-ifs and the potential that he might possibly bring to our roster, all of his skill sets, and what happens if he what happens if he can find a way to stick around to the regular season. With all due respect, and remember I'm saying with all due respect, that idea ain't worth a velvet painting of a whale and a dolphin getting it on. That is the exact response this story deserves. I know I've mentioned it during the podcast before, but thanks to our listener, Mike Swenson from Australia, I've begun watching and following rugby. Our team's the Queensland Reds out of Brisbane, and they're, or is it Brisbane? I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Either way, it's annoying to wake up at like 4 a.m. and I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of Twitter messages between Drew and and Mike. I mean, I'm trying to sleep here. On Sundays. Call each other. On Sundays. (laughs) During football season, I wake up at 5 a.m. every Sunday. Just had a reason to get up and get ready to go tailgate. It's time to get up and get ready to go tailgate. On Saturdays, I am now waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning as a reflex 
to go turn on ESPN Plus, which I subscribe to specifically to watch rugby. It's like I don't even need an alarm anymore. I just wake up and I turn it on. I don't know. This team is the Buffalo Bills of Australian Super Rugby. They're passionate. They're, they've got a serious new head coach. Talent issues, but they've got a heart and a real habit of playing up and down to their competition. And they lose in some of the most frustrating ways possible. I mean, it's been fun, and I've learned to appreciate the game of rugby. So now knowing what I know about it, I'm willing to make a Seagram's bet with all of you out there. At Rock Pile Report on Twitter. Any takers... This player does not have an NFL future, just like everybody else who's tried it alongside him. What? Well, what? We got to break this down. What is your criteria to, to play a regular season game? Is that like your criteria? To, One snap in a regular season game. Make make it past the first wave of cuts. Um, I don't know where do you where do you want to lay this? Because I don't think it much matters. I mean, Chris. First of all, I've got history on my side. In all of NFL history, the number of former rugby players that made the pros can get counted on one hand. Most of them were kickers, which makes sense because it's kickers and the rest worked in a blocking capacity because those are the only two skill sets that fluently translate from rugby to football. Man versus man, on the line blocking, or kicking the ball accurately. Literally almost nothing else between the games is the same. I mean, I've heard everything. Over the course of the last few days from people. Well, well, you know, rugby's 11 uh, 11 on 11, and so is football. And both games have tackling, and both games have kicks for points. And uh, there's a predetermined end zone, so they must be the same game. Chris, (laughs) question for you. Figure skating and ice hockey both take place on ice. And they're both played with skates. How similar are they in terms of technique? Well, I mean... You look at figure skating, I mean, number one, you go to the top of the list is Brian Boitano. I mean, he's a stay-at-home defenseman. He really lays the lumber at the blue line if you try to come across. You know, it, it, I I would put Zidane Chara and Brian Boitano in the same sentence. <laughs> and one of them happens to be a caveman at the NFL, at NHL level. I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about here, people. I mean... Think about this in terms of just the game and the the, the hurdles that this player is going to face trying to make an NFL roster in his current capacity. Three specific philosophical hurdles. First, the most obvious, rugby players don't have equipment slowing them down. I mean, think about this. Anybody who says, well, you're an athlete's an athlete's an athlete. Okay, you run quickly in what is spandex and cleats. Do me a favor. Everyone listening to this, if you firmly believe that, put on some cleats, run 50 yards and time yourself and see how fast you do it. Then come back, put on a jock jock strap, pick up 10 pounds of literally anything and run the same 50 yards and tell me if you do it as quickly. That's what it's like putting on NFL equipment. Yes, it's cumbersome. It affects your agility. So you have to be able to prove that you have agility with that stuff on. Secondly, In rugby, the ball is moved straight ahead or it's pitched side to side for the express purpose of moving directly forward. That's not how NFL football works. Not at all. Also, in rugby, tackling from the side or behind has an explicit set of rules. And if you don't follow them to the T, you are absolutely going to get penalized. That is not something that exists in the NFL. In fact, Chris... Tackling, you just get the guy to the ground. It doesn't matter how you do it. Exactly, but you don't aim for their head. There are there are explicit rules as to how you can tackle from anything but straight on in rugby. And then, I think in what might be the biggest hindrance to this guy, in rugby there is no open field blocking. No player without the ball in his hands might can stop the progression of a defensive player from reaching the ball carrier. That's a penalty. It's called obstruction. I found that out because of an obscure penalty. The, the, the Queensland Reds were playing the equivalent of the New England Patriots of their league. Their scoring differential is plus 73 right now in rugby. Nobody else is above 30. It's fucking incredible. And in a, a close loss to that team, 
the Reds got called for obstruction. I couldn't understand it, so I had to read up on it. So think about this. If this player is going to make it to the NFL, he's got to first acclimate to the idea that his agility, his speed, it, now he's got to achieve it wearing pads. Then he's going to have to get past the fact that the angles that he's anticipating contact from have dramatically changed. People are going to be hitting him from sides that he didn't, he's never encountered. And he's 27 years old, Chris. He's been playing his given sport for years. So if he's 27, that means he's got three years to figure it out as an NFL running back. Yeah. I don't think it, it, time is not on your side. Well, and that's the thing. Even if all of that clicks, even if he figures out those aspects of it, he's got to deal with the fact that they're never asked to develop vision. Think about NFL vision. It's what makes LaShawn McCoy special. LaShawn McCoy is a running back who sets up his moves before he makes them, but he's, he's, he sets up his first move to set up his second move. It's why you, it's why he's so dangerous in the open field. Because not only is, if he makes that first break, he's gonna break the first guy's ankles, and then he's gonna try to cut into the open field because he's already anticipated where the coverage is. Think about a guy, Chris, who's never had to look past the man directly in front of him. If, if I'm Wade, Wade would have absolutely, if he even made it to the NFL, it seems like he'd have to play in an offense where the fullback is used immensely. Well, not even that though, because again, you're, you're not used to following blocks. That's my point. I mean, look at Frank Gore. Frank Gore's never been a burner, but he's been a guy who finds creases and follows his blocks and churns out yardage. That's what he's been for his entire career. Now you're throwing in a running back who's never been trained to find a crease behind his blockers, identify the guys who might hit him at the second level, and then, using footwork and agility in the hole, redirect to try to find more open space. He's never had to do that. Chris, there are high school kids right now, right now in the United States of America, who know more about vision and about setting up blocks and about following the flow of a blocking scheme than this guy. So yes, all of the athleticism in the world is nice, but that doesn't mean dick when you put it on a football field. And that's why no one outside of a blocker or a kicker from rugby makes it in the NFL. Point blank and period. Okay? And so with that said, I hope that this is the last that I have to hear about this. But like I said, at Rockpile Report on Twitter, if any of you want to spawn a piece of this, a Seagram's bet on the future of this kid, we can hash out the details. Go ahead and come at me. Folks, I, <laughs> I don't want to bore you all night with talk about rugby, who signed, contracts, because that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about the NFL draft. And here we are just a few weeks away from the draft talking about what I believe to be one of the most important positions for the Bills coming up in this year's crop. Second most important. I'd say second most important. We hit the Rockpile Reports 2019 NFL Draft Preview Series on the offensive line. Now, folks, the offensive line, it's in flux, but at the same time, we've seen a whole slew of free agents brought in. I've always said it's, we, we basically we had, we took off an old Band-Aid. We put a new one on with all of these people that we've signed to one, two-year deals, more four, but it's all one to two year deals. Exactly. It's a new band aid, is what it is. And contrary to the thinking of a lot of Bills fans, this <laughs> it's still a need. Things are not all settled on the front. I mean, let, let's take a look at it. Let's all open, take a deep breath, open a fresh beer, and let's take a look at where we stand right now. First of all, current cap allocation. The Buffalo Bills have $35 million invested right now, today, on the offensive line. Now, that's with Bodine and Ducasse still on the roster. Without them, they come down to about $31.2 million, which is about, it's, it's on the low end of average for the NFL. Wait, well, well, what was it last year, 12? Last year was 12. So, <laughs> so we're moving up in the world. Moving on up. The number of starters we have at the position, and this is where things start to get dicey. Three, in my opinion. First of all, left tackle Deion Dawkins. Struggled in his sophomore season after he had a pretty promising rookie year, Chris. 
I mean, he's the reason we saw fit to get rid of Cordy Glenn. And then he went out there and I don't want to say fell apart, but pro football focus grade for run blocking. He dropped from a 78.7 to a 58.9. He was flagged 13 times in 2018, which is the third most among tackles in the NFL. The pre-draft analysis on Dawkins was that this is a guy who could be a Pro Bowl caliber guard and a serviceable right tackle. To see him play at left tackle, the question I have is, was that rookie year a fluke? Is that who he can be? Or Because you think about it, he Chris, to his defense, he lost a Pro Bowl guard. Yep. Richie Incognito, for being crazy, was a very good player. And when the guard talent around him declined, so did his play. So I guess the question is, was his play last year just a product of, hey, he didn't have as great a talent around him? Or is it just that he's not very good at left tackle and the NFL caught up to him in terms of film, in terms of study, in terms of his own habits? I mean, I just don't think he's on the path. (laughs) Last year shook my confidence in his trajectory as a stud left tackle. Then you look at center. This is probably the most solid position we have, and even that's a little bit shaky. Mitch Morse, the highest paid acquisition for the offseason for the Buffalo Bills. He's an athletic offensive uh, offensive center. He's not a mauler at the point of attack. He, his whole game is based on him being a high-floor pass blocker who, who is a mediocre run blocker. He's fluid, though, when you ask him to run in space, which is good because it allows us to be creative when you're talking about pulling centers and pulling guards and getting, you know, getting creating space on the edges of the offense and defense. So when you say pulling center, does that mean he'll pull around and maybe chip and end and get to the second level? Yes. So he's better, he's better at blocking linebackers. Look at you learning football! <laughs> My man, up top! So he's better at blocking linebackers <laughs> who are more of his size than... <laughs> Somebody that's, you know, 300 pounds. And then you move on to the guard position. Now, this is offensive guard Quentin Spain, who, for a mountain of a man at 6'5", 330 pounds, is surprisingly athletic. His grades in pass protection are incredible. The guy is phenomenal. The downside for him is run blocking. He's kind of been up and down. He's had great years followed by terrible years. But he's a day one starter. So with that said, those are the three guys that we know for a fact are locks on the Bills roster. And whether Bills fans want to hear it or not, that's where where everything else here becomes a gamble. First of all, you've got offensive tackle Ty Neschke, a guy I was high on in the preseason, a guy I was pumped we signed. Because you said we (laughs) we should sign him before it happened. Fucking right I did. But he's, he's a career backup in the NFL. Mind you, a backup behind highly drafted players. He's shown well whenever he's had to start, and he's handled some of the NFL's best pass rushers. There was a game where he was playing left tackle for the Washington Redskins, and they had Jadavian Clowney going against him for the entirety of the game, and he owned Clowney. Clowney might as well have not existed that game. And that's thanks to Neshke's talent and his acumen for playing tackle. Now, here's the problem. You're talking about a guy whose reps have come at the left tackle position. Anybody can tell you that they're, you're talking about different technique, different, you're using a different leg to plant and push off of when you're mirroring pass rushers. It takes different, it's muscle memory. And while that doesn't sound like much for an NFL player to learn, it can be the difference between a starting caliber player and a backup caliber player. Wasn't that the deal with uh, Cyrus Quanjo? Yes, that was the exact deal with Cyrus Quanjo. Cyrus Quanjo played left tackle at Alabama. We took him in the second round and then tried to plug him in at right tackle. Well, we were banking on his arthritic knee to be his post leg that he was going to push off of whenever he had to get into his protection sets. And then we wondered why he struggled. I mean, it's not rocket science. This is not, it's, it doesn't, just because you played left tackle well doesn't mean you can play right tackle. And given the fact that he has no snaps there, that's cause for concern for me to think we can just go into the season with him immediately as our starter at right. We'd like to hope so, but it's, it has yet to be proven. Right tackle Adrian Waddell. 
This is a guy who's recently signed. He's got experience with the Patriots. He has experience as a swing tackle and has played both positions. But he's got seven starts in the last three seasons. And according to Pro Football Focus, is rated as a below average starter in both pass blocking and run blocking. So I don't know what he is other than a high quality backup. Even a, I don't even want to call him high quality, an experienced backup. Guard Joe, uh, John Feliciano. Now this is a guy, okay? <laughs> this is a guy who's versatile, experienced playing all three interior line positions. And he's played them well. He's a mauler in the run game. His pass protection needs some work. Hopefully you don't have to rely on him. With, I mean, that's that's the word on him coming out of Raiders camp. And the Raiders were a team that wanted him back. Every blog I read, every fan post I read, everything I read about John Feliciano was fans talking about how he was a guy that the Raiders had to bring back because it would keep some continuity on their offensive line And yet, these were the negative things that they had to say about him. Which makes me question, Chris, our ability to turn him, just trust him with a starting job. Well, based on what you have here about Feliciano, it just seems like he is a new Ryan Groy for us in the sense that he can play center if needed and guard. And who knows, maybe in a new scheme, maybe there's something they see in him that they'll they'll unlock that other teams couldn't get out of him to this point. Who knows? Again, all of these guys are gambles. Guard center, Spencer Long. Spencer Long's a former starter for the Redskins at both left guard and center. He started every game that he was available for. <laughs> it's, and that is the caveat with this player. He, he's, been injured, he's been injured most of his career, Chris. He's never completed a full season. Never. He has yet to go 16 games. He's had some sort of injury that caused him to miss playing time. And last year, he was the starting center for the Jets. And then he was injured early on in the season and never was really effective, so they shut him down for a while. And when he came back, he didn't win the starting center job back. And so they cut him this offseason. That's why he's here. And while his contract structure is favorable, and you look at what he is, and he again, another guy with upside. Sounds like. Do you want to trust that as a starting offensive lineman for your team? Based on everything that you just said, it sounds like this guy's more of a camp body. I don't know about a camp body. He's definitely going to be here. He's a guy who has the ability to play NFL football at a high level when he's available. But the question is, does he turn into a starter you can trust week in and week out? That sounds like. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question because he hasn't proven that he can be available for any length of time. So that sounds like a future Seagram's bet once August gets here. <laughs> We're going to get into that. And then you've got a, a slew of offensive guards behind them. Just developmental guys. You've got offensive guards, uh, Ike Bodiger, uh, Jeremiah Searles. He's a tackle thrown in there. Connor McDermott's a tackle. And then Wyatt Teller. Now, when you look at these four guys, they're all young, cost-controlled developmental projects that were held over from 2018. Minimal playing time. They have 12 starts between all four of them last season. Didn't Teller start like the end of the season? Yes. Teller is the only drafted member of this developmental project group. Okay, so all of the rest of these guys are here on low salaries with no dead money involved. They're just here. No one knows what they're going to be or if they're ever going to be anything. So when we look to the draft and you talk about philosophy, here's what I think. Before I really get into this, I think it's worth mentioning. Three of our recent acquisitions, Morse, Feliciano, and Spain, are players that, as I researched them, their previous fan bases and the analysts associated with them viewed those guys as priorities to retain. You know, they all said, Quentin Spain, he's a guy that the, the Titans need to hang on to. John Feliciano, he's a guy who the Raiders need to hang on to. Mitch Morse... Well, we looked good without him, but it would be great to have him back because he'll be good for the future of our team. I read that the tight or the Titans couldn't keep Spain because the money that they had allocated for Spain they used to buy votes. <laughs> In a meaningless Twitter poll? Yeah, yes. I, I heard something about that too. But so that makes me feel pretty good about some of the players that we that we found here. And even the guys who I just may have sounded a little bit down on as I'm running down the roster. 
I'm not unhappy that they're here. Not at all. It's just that none of these guys, if we're talking about the season starting tomorrow, there's not a one of those guys that I would look at and say, okay, he's a blue chip starter on my offensive line. So with that said, only two of our free agent acquisitions have a track record of playing in an NFL starting level. They project favorably, but that's not a guarantee. And Chris, our our quarterback needs a better offensive line, right? We can't have a recurrence of what happened last year. Yeah, which <laughs> all, all of this talk about us taking DK Metcalf wants me. I want to take a number two pencil and stab my eyes out. You got to <laughs> you have to protect Josh Allen. Thank you. That and getting after the passer are the two of the most important things in the game. Protect your quarterback, get the other one. Right now, the Bills aren't truly equipped to do either one at a, at a high level. And then you look at the composition of the current roster. Let me run this down for you, Chris. We have three left tackles. One two-year, two centers. One four-year starter, one experience backup. Six guards, one three-year starter, an array of backups with varying levels of experience and upside. One starter at right. I don't even want to say starter. One player on the entire roster who's taken snaps at right tackle. I'm going to repeat that for you in the chief seats. We have one offensive lineman who has taken more than a handful of reps and started at least one or two games. At right tackle. One. Is nobody else concerned about this? Am I the only one freaking out over here? It's 100% a need. I mean, when I look at these mock drafts, or I should say it, I've looked at two and both of them made, to to your point, made me want to stab my eyes out. Because I wonder, who are the idiots who put this stuff together? Doug Farr. (laughs) He's by far the worst. That's what his last name was. Oh, Jesus. There's everyone keeps talking about the I get it the defensive line talent it's there it's it's <laughs> you can't say anything more about it and I get it that the skill positions the wide receivers the tight ends the running backs those are the sexy picks the teams that often win the most games in football do it by protecting their quarterback yeah, we should be doing what Dallas did you know <laughs> what like four three four years ago. Where they just had like a string of like two drafts where they took a bunch of tackles and uh, they got that. Who was that first round pick that that fell out of the draft because of an off the field issue? Oh, the kid from LSU. Yes. Um, Jesus, I can't. I, Lyle Collins. Yes. You get lucky with that. You you, you got to build an offensive line to protect Allen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand that people are excited about the job that Brandon Bean has done in terms of raising the talent level across the offensive line this off season. I am, but, and I say but, to act as though we're all of a sudden set up for success just because things are quote-unquote better than last year. Chris, that's like saying that L.A. is a nicer place ever since those pesky riots in the 90s. (laughs) I mean, Jesus, things last year were as bad as they could get. They were as bad as they've been in the last decade and a half. So marginal improvement over that doesn't exactly win me over. No, and you don't even know what we're going to be at offensive line. Yes, we signed six people, but you don't know if you don't know if we're going to be good. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to take a wide receiver with the potential that we could have a decent line. I want to know that we have a defense, uh, awesome offensive line before we draft a number one wide receiver. I don't want to think that okay, well, we have a tackle who might project to playing right tackle, but he's never done it. I don't want to head into the season with that. I watched Jordan Mills. Okay, I watched him for Get years. Get his, his pants pulled down? I I just, I know that we need to be better, and right now I don't know that there's anything proven on this roster that says we will be. And then there's the contractual angle that a lot of people seem to miss. I mean, it might surprise a lot of you. All these bodies that we just signed on the offensive line, I mean, you think things are trending in the right direction. There are only three players on the whole offensive line right now that have contracts running past 2020. That's Mitch Morse, that's Spencer Long, and that's Wyatt Teller. Every other member of our current offensive line group will not be under contract by 2021, as it currently stands. 
Does that not scare anybody? Okay. It's a perfect spot to take a tackle in the first round, knowing that they can sit and learn for one year with these one- to two-year deals. Well, that's exactly it, Chris. That's my logic. This is a goldmine of an opportunity here in front of this football team. If you want to picture this as a train station, and you want to talk about building offensive line talent, we have, in your own words, slapped a Band-Aid on what has been a terrible offensive line for the last, two, the last season. Yeah, it's a fresh Band-Aid. You, just, you fixed it to an average level. You brought the talent of your offensive line to about an NFL average level, and until I see him play, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to try to project it beyond that because I don't know what we're going to get out of this group. But with that said, you have the opportunity right now to head into a draft class that sounds and seems like it's pretty deep, and you can draft solid guards and solid right tackles, hell, even a left tackle right now, and find long-term continuity and possible improvement. At a position that has not only plagued this team for years, but you wouldn't have to pay a premium to do it. Therein lies the rub. And that's why I, that's why, Chris, that's why we pushed offensive line this far down the draft conversation chart. It's a heavy need. It's a heavy need. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So with that, without further ado, we bring aboard this week's guest analyst, Mr. Russell Brown. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How are you guys? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. For those of you who aren't familiar, Mr. Russell Brown, CoverOne.net. Okay, he's he's one of their national scouts. He runs the CoverOne.net uh, podcast for drafts. I mean, he's he, he's engrossed in the scouting community, and just we were just talking off air about all of the things he's got lined up for himself. What do you have? Two radio spots tonight? Uh, I've got for the Cover One NFL Draft. Podcast. I've got two guest spots with one with Danny Kelly of The Ringer, uh, the other with Jeff Risden of ESPN 96.1 in Grand Rapids in the state of Michigan, but also of the Browns Wire and Lions Wire. And then I jump on uh, 1010 uh, FM for uh, Southern California for Palm Beach in, in LA. So that's in an hour. So it's uh, it's been a busy time, but. Uh, you know, it's it's a good time. So I'm very pleased to be joining you boys as you guys have alcoholic beverages and I drink water. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of how we roll over here. I mean, I mean, it's cr- I appreciate the fact that you take time out of your busy schedule to work us in. I mean, it means a lot, man. I yeah. mean, especially no, considering you, you guys do great stuff over there. So well, it's, I appreciate it's definitely it. worth it. So what have you? I mean, this off season, I've seen pictures of you on Twitter. You're traveling around. You're doing all kinds of stuff. What were some of the highlights of your off season so far in terms of just scouting work? Uh, the Senior Bowl for sure. I mean, that's always just like top notch. I mean, being able to go in and, and sit around with literally uh, every single head coach in the NFL, um, and then defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, the, the the just like the camaraderie of it is just insane. And then like getting to talk with the players, like. You know, I have on my phone interviews with Andre Dillard, who we'll talk about momentarily, uh, Jacoby Myers from NC State, um, and on the Cover One like YouTube page, we've got interviews with like Drew Samaya of uh, o- Oklahoma. So, I mean, there's just like there's just so much to to the Senior Bowl, and then just like overall, just being on you know the radio a lot more than I was last year. Like last last year at this time was like my first time being on the radio, and here I am now, pretty much doing it two or three times a week, and getting just like doors are opening and things are happening. So it's just, it's been busy, but it's been a lot of fun and chasing the dream and making a hobby a a thing. So we'll see what happens. Now I'll tell you what you work, you work so hard at this stuff that I mean, you deserve it, man. You deserve all the good things that are happening to you. Now here's something that I got to call you out on here because I don't think we as Bills fans deserve this. Going over at cover cover one dot net, I'm go, I'm scrolling through your Twitter feed and I come across your uh, quote unquote players the AFC teams need, and you pegged us in this draft as we <laughs> need DK Metcalf. I mean, what the hell, man? Do, do, in, don't put that evil on me. Even when I went on uh, ESPN Rochester, I said the same thing a couple weeks back, and I I kind of stuck to it. Now the reason why I say this is simply because 
there's not a number one receiver in Buffalo. And I don't care what any of you Bills fans say. And look, I have a Sammy Watkins jersey hanging up in my closet right here, okay? <laughs> and so, like, I am a Bills fan in heart. But, like, Metcalf to me is a true number one receiver. And I think there's two guys in this class that are true number one receivers, and it's Akeem Butler and DK Metcalf. These are guys that I think that could become, like, a Julio Jones, a DeAndre Hopkins. That is not on the Bills roster. Cole Beasley – Great gadget player, a guy that you can use in the in the middle of the field. You, you have Zay Jones, who is kind of like a, a number two receiver. I don't think he's going to be a number one. I know, you know, uh, what's his name? Isaiah McKenzie, another deep threat, a guy that can go deep down the field. So, like, yeah, you have a, a couple of different weapons there. You sign Tyler Croft. There, there's pieces to the puzzle, but a true number one, a guy that can really stand out and match up against teams' number one cornerbacks, you don't have. And I think DK, DK Metcalf is – a good fit there and I think it would be really fun to watch him develop alongside Josh Allen but my heart tells me and I, I this is what I think in, in, in my gut the pick is going to be I think it's going to be Andre Dillard out of Washington State that's what I truly believe it's going to be wow. the amount of <clears throat> the amount of re- like the, the resources that they've had um, at the senior bowl the, they had their offensive line coach there he was up close and personal watching all of those guys Andre Dillard was in that group they had their personnel out there at the Washington State Pro Day. Um, that He's been in the facility visiting uh, One Bills Drive. We know that. Um, so I think everything really matches up. And I, I think as far as like being a, a top 10 pick, he's the, he's the 10th best player on my board. So I, I truly believe he's, he's probably going to be their guy. Because I, I believe that Deion Dawkins was a guard coming out of Temple. I like him, you know, what he's been able to do at left tackle. But I, I think moving him inside to guard – and then you bring in Andre Dillard at left tackle with everything else that you've signed this offseason, I, I think it's really a home run for Josh Allen and that offensive line. See, now that's interesting. Now, folks who have listened to this long enough know that, generally speaking, I close these types of segments with a rundown of the players that I like in this draft class. It's Most of them are depth, you know, d- deeper down the chart kind of guys because I don't, I'm not a scout. I don't pretend to be. But you've just opened up a giant can of worms here because one of the guys on my list and a guy that hasn't gotten any real talk or traction around here is offensive tackle Andre Dillard. Now, for our mm-hmm. listeners, he's a senior out of Washington State. He's a big body tackle. He's not the most athletic dude in the world, but he's got great footwork. He's got subpar run grades, and it sounds like he's going to require some refinement. So I'm not going to lie. Everything I've looked at, I mean, he's a big man who's been talked about in a lot of different uh, analysts' <laughs> columns that I've read and things I've looked at, that he's a developmental prospect with a low floor but a high ceiling. Listening to you talk about him like he's going to be the number nine pick, what, what is that? <laughs> How does that work? Explain <laughs> well, that to and me. So, so to, to kind of elaborate further is like, you have a player like Andre Dillard who had 900, and according to Pro Football Focus, he had 966 true pass blocking sets this uh, this past year, or in, in like throughout his career and, and stuff like that. So um, he's a player that is certainly more of a pass blocker. He's more of that traditional pass blocker, going to pr- protect uh, Josh Allen's blind side. But the thing that really stands out with him is one, the footwork. He tested well at the combine and. I think he's the most athletic offensive tackle in this class and out of this group. So you're getting a guy that you have a lot of tools to work with, and I think he could certainly get better um, as a run blocker, certainly a guy that needs to take a, a little bit better angles and do those types of things when climbing to the second level and establishing the run game. But overall, I love the foot speed. I love his ability to transition his weight from his post foot to his set foot and being able to, to, to do those types of things when – dealing with edge rushers with, that are you know, going off with speed and, and doing different types of counter moves. Um, and then really the biggest thing is the hand placement. That's one of the first things I look at for offensive linemen. His hand placement is consistently in the chest plate. Pad level is normally relatively low. He can anchor. And on our Cover One page, we, we have an interview with him where he talks about establishing how to handle counter moves with a snatch trap technique. And being able to watch him use that and utilize that in games, it's very key. And it's going to be, I think, very clutch in his development in the pros, and it's going to help this offensive line. So I certainly think it's going to be uh, something that's just going to help the Bills, and, and that's just what my gut believes is going to be the pick for them. Jesus. Okay, so now what you've, what you've just done is <laughs> – because I have in my mind the way I think things are going to go. 
<laughs> Everybody does. Everybody looks at draft boards. We listen to all the you know the draft because again, yeah. I'm no better than half the armchair scouts and GMs out there. So yeah. what this does is it makes me go back in my own mind and reevaluate what the hell this class is. I mean, because I thought I knew. So well, this this offensive line class is is very good. I don't mean to interrupt you, but no. like this offensive line class is is very good in my opinion. And I've got five offensive linemen in my top fifteen. Um, one of them is a center. The, the other four offensive tackles at 15 is Cody Ford out of Oklahoma. Garrett Bradbury, Bradbury is the center at 12. Andre Dillard's at 10 um, out of Washington State. Jawan Taylor's at seven out of Florida, and Jonah Williams is at five out of Alabama. Now, I think Jonah Williams would be a phenomenal fit just simply because of Brian Dabble and everything like that, uh, just like that natural connection, right? But realistically, I think the the, the player that they seem to be most intrigued with just because of the things that I said was because of Andre Dillard. So um, that's just why I, I – look, I, I could be wrong. Charlie Casterly in his mock draft, he's got Andre Dillard. I was looking at that before I came on. Now, Casterly, he's a buffoon, I know, but um, – <laughs> Okay, I was going to say, mean, Charlie Casterly, I don't know – I mean, the man, he's aged. We'll call it that. We'll, we'll chalk it up to age. That's what I'm willing to say. <laughs> but – so, I mean, I guess when we talk about this class as a whole then, just a couple questions I want to ask you because, I mean, we're going to talk about some, you know, I guess some prospects and some different storylines that are going on within this class. But as a whole, two questions that come to my mind as just the casual fan watching this play out. First of all, you take a look at what the Buffalo Bills have here. We've signed a ton of offense, but we have six guards on the roster right now, which is crazy to me. And we just got done running them all down. Is the interior part of the interior lineman or tackle class which do you of the two which do you think is stronger this year well it really depends on what people want to consider the right tackles of this group what do you consider cody ford some people consider him a guard some people consider dalton reisner a, a, a guard but he's you know, on my board listed as an offensive tackle so i i have a lot of offensive tackles on my board um cody ford against at 15 it, at 30 is chris lindstrom at uh, 36 is Dalton Reisner out of Kansas State. So again, that's what is that? That's two, three. I'm, I'm, ta- I'm sitting at eight, nine offensive linemen, just simply um, in the the top 40 of my board, and seven of them are offensive tackles, in my opinion. Because when a guy plays right tackle in college, more often than not, I'm going to try that guy out at right tackle, kind of like the Deion Dawkins experiment played left tackle in college, you're going to play him at left tackle, and I agree with that method. Now, is it working in year two? Uh, it kind of, sort of, it did. We, I think he could we still just hit all there. over. We just hit all over the fact that he he regressed. And now the question mm-hmm. becomes, is that because people have more tape on him? Because pass exactly. rushers have started, are starting to figure him out? Is it because right. his limitations have been exposed? Or is it simply because he didn't have the guard talent next to him that he had the previous season with Richie Incognito, who... I mean, for the the man is a lunatic, but at the same time, he was a hell of a football player. So you can kind of go back and forth with that, depending on how you want to see it. But ultimately, he had a down year, and he's a you know as we've explained, he's the type of guy who you shift inside, and he very well could be a very good. You know, he's been talked about. He can't, he was talked about coming into last into his rookie draft about his upside as a perennial Pro Bowl guard, just given his. Skill set and given what he does well. Putting him at tackle, maybe he can survive out there. But maybe that's not the best usage of his talent. You know what I mean? So with that, I, I just look at this and I think to myself, you know, you have a point. There's different skill sets and you can move people around. Is this, is this offensive line class top heavy is the other question that comes to my mind as the fan watching this play out. Is this a class that... You know, after the first round is over and you see this slew of offensive linemen go, it starts to become slim pickings as you get to the third, fourth, fifth round. Or do you think the talent is going to be more evenly distributed? I think it's I think it's relatively deep just all the way over. I mean, when you get into those fourth, fifth rounds of this draft, you're, you're going to get into players like Max Sharping out of Northern Illinois. You're going to get into Michael Jordan, not the basketball player, Michael Jordan out of Ohio <laughs> State, who I actually did a, a – a joint practice with when he was playing at Plymouth High School in the state of Michigan. I was coaching the other team, and 
the guy actually hit me in the chest and his hand is like the size of my front door um, <laughs> and almost knocked me like unconscious. But then you've also got like a player like Nate Davis, who I like in like round three. So you have like, well, at the top 15, certainly you've got five players, maybe even six players in the, in the top 20 that you could consider as first round picks. And, and that's a lot of players in itself on the offensive mm-hmm. line. But when you even when you get like later in this draft, like we mentioned, like I said, Sharping, Michael Jordan, you have Lamont Gellard out of Georgia, uh, Ross Piercebacher potentially out of Alabama, and I know there's going to be guys that we talked about later on the list um, as, as well. So like I, I think this is just a deep draft overall. Guys like Eltington J- uh, Jenkins out of Mississippi State, Eric McCoy out of Texas A&M, uh, Yadni Kajust out of West Virginia. Where is he medically? That's the biggest concern with him. He's missed time with knee injuries. So if he can check out there, he is certainly a player, I think, on the second or third day of the draft that you could plug and potentially play from day one at left tackle. Um, so there's, again, there's a ton of players in this draft. Ben Powers, Drew Samia um, out of Oklahoma. So there is, again, just a lot of, of depth um, on the offensive line. I think it's the deepest it's been, I, I think, in my opinion, in quite a few years. Um, it's nothing like it was a few years back when Garrett Bowles went um, in the first round. There was really quite the struggle with offensive tackles in that draft. You had Garrett Bowles, Cam Robinson. That was the same draft as Deion Dawkins. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, it like there was just it was slim pickings. And this year, I think it's like kind of take your pick at what you want to do. And if you take a right tackle, do you want to plug that guy in at right guard um, or, or left guard? Um, so there's just there are so many players, and I like I could sit here all day and talk about every single one of them. <laughs> well, so I won't make you do that, but here's what I'm going to do, because there are some storylines <laughs> here bubbling that just as I'm listening to you speak. So first and foremost, you just said something incredibly interesting in the fact that you see that there's, you're talking about in the top rounds of this draft, there could be 15 offensive linemen that potentially could be in that early day, you know, early day two to day one conversation. Now, mm-hmm. the, by all conventional wisdom, there's three tackles being talked about in the first round. You've got uh, Juwan Taylor, Jonah Williams out of Alabama, and Dalton Risner. Now, you just threw Andre Dillard into that conversation, which makes me question where you have these guys ranked. Who are your top three tackles in this class if you consider, if you consider uh, Dillard to be one of them? Uh, so it's Jonah Williams who's my fifth-ranked player overall. That's my OT1. Uh, Jawan Taylor's at seventh um, out of Florida. He's, he's OT2. And then at 10 is Andre Dillard out of Washington State. It's OT3. Um, Cody Ford's at 15 as offensive tackle four. Then you get into, where is he? Uh, there's Chris Lindstrom. That's a guard. Then you get to 36. You've got Dalton Risner, uh Kansas State, and then you go to Yanni Kajust at 54 out of West Virginia, Caleb McGarry at 56 out of Washington, um, and then Greg Little at 67 out of Ole Miss. So, I mean, what is that, eight, nine offensive tackles in the top 75? So, um, I, again, I think it's a deep class at this position, and uh, like, I, 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 I don't know what else to say other than, you know, Andre Dillard is a guy I'm a big fan of, and I like Jawan Taylor a lot. I love his foot speed. He really showed that um, at the combine. And then Jonah Williams, I think, is just a true technician. I think he's you know one of the cleaner prospects in the class. I like that you, you're talking about this class being so deep, considering that just before we brought you on, we were talking about what we already have, and a lot of the guards and tackles <laughs> that we signed are on one- to two-year deals. So this seems mm-hmm. like a perfect chance for us to get somebody in and then they get, you know, practice reps and learn behind some people. Well, and also too, like you can get you can get something of, you know, as we talked about Deion Dawkins, like let's just say they hypothetically speaking take Andre Dillard. Okay, there's your left tackle for the future and you're going to play him in year 1. There's no doubt about it. Your first round pick should be playing year 1. In my unless it's a quarterback or just depending on the situation, of course. But him, I think unless he, it's he a quarterback, could, you know, out of Wyoming who shouldn't see the field, and then all of a sudden he's out there because <laughs> you started Nathan Peterman. Well, yeah, and then you put him behind the eight ball because then he you benched uh, Peterman, then you play Allen, and then he gets hurt, and then you're playing Derek Anderson, and then and then it just everything's screwed up there. But um, as far as like your offensive line would go, you could play 
Andre Dillard at left tackle. You could move Deion Dawkins to left guard. You have Mitch Morris now at center. Really, you have a competition at right guard and, and right tackle. Um, we have no right tackles. You can, I just got done telling our listeners this. We have one player on the roster who's taken significant reps at the right tackle position, and it's Adrian Waddell. Arts at right tackle. And that's why it's infuriating to me to hear people say, oh, offensive tackle, that's not a need. That's not a need. Have we all lost our minds? You have to have tackle play in today's NFL. You have to. Well, and yeah, you could certainly do it. I mean, you could certainly look at a right. I mean, you could draft Jawan Taylor if he's there. And again, it's 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 tough. Jawan, like Jawan Taylor, I think, is the best right tackle in this class. I like Cody Ford. Uh, if Dalton Reisner is there in the second round, somehow magically, I mean, I'd be shocked. But maybe that's a thing that you look at as well. I don't know. I, I know. I know. One of the questions on the sheet is, you know, Deion Dawkins moving him from left tackle to right tackle. I don't know how I really feel about that. I think like you could probably do it because I know you had Cordy Glenn, but didn't they move Cordy Glenn to right tackle? If I'm remembering no, correctly, no, no, they traded him away. They actually said, okay, Deion Dawkins played so well when you were hurt, you're gone, Cordy. You're out of here. They shipped him off. So he did, they didn't even they didn't play together, right? They no, they played kind of behind each. Like he Dawkins started behind Glenn. Glenn went down with okay. an injury. Dawkins f- got the start, and they put him out there. And then they said, "Okay, you did so well in these seven or eight games that we're going to ship off Cordy Glenn as part of our bid to move up and get Josh right. Allen." And then last season, you saw Dawkins' play decline drastically in some facets of the game. And so now the question is, is that a smart move? Is it, Was that a flash in the pan? Or is this just now the NFL is catching up to Cordy Glenn and he's not progressing fast enough to stay ahead of it? So it's going to be really interesting to see where they value, A, Deion Dawkins and how that dictates the pick and how they attempt to address this. I mean, you would assume that Ty Neschke can, you know, he played very well at left tackle as a backup. But at the same time, you don't know that offensive linemen can make that adjustment for all the reasons that we already right. beat our listeners' heads in about. But at the end of the day, it's, it's encouraging to hear that there's going to be a lot of prospects. There's going to be a lot of bites at the apple if we choose to go that direction. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of players that I'm really curious about in this draft, there's a storyline that I don't think is getting any press here anywhere. But I've got to ask the question to somebody who's in the know. What the fuck happened to Greg Little? Okay, this guy came out uh, at the beginning of the year. He was viewed as probably the number one tackle in the class. Now he's not being talked about as a first-round pick, even though he played in the SEC against some of the best pass-rushing talent that exists. I mean, what happened to this guy? Am I allowed to – I heard you dropping that bomb. Absolutely. Drop yeah. We were blue over here at the Rock Pile Report. <laughs> okay, so the answer to your question is because he's not very fucking good. That's the question. Like that's the answer to your question. He, he's not. He's not good. It, like like I said, the very first thing that you look for in an offensive lineman is hand placement. His hand placement is consistently outside every single time, and he instantly has to go to like reset, recover, and then he comes into the combine. I thought he looked out of shape. I don't think he looked that good. And this is a guy that just looked just he looked lost man five three three forty only a 25 inch vertical jump which you're not expecting the guy to jump through the roof but you want to see some explosiveness 20 yard shuttle wait how big was it how big was that vertical 25 25 inches yes chris after the show you and me periscope i am going to attempt to beat that because i think i can (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, like it's okay if you're around, like, 27, 28, maybe 30. Like, it's fine. But it just – he didn't – I don't think he's ever looked that good. And, you know, he checked in at 6'5", 3'10". Like, there's potential there. There's no doubt. Like, and it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of potential. But he might be a guy that just makes a move to, to maybe right tackle. I don't know. I Like, there's, I, there, there's players out there that – like a Rashawn Gary, a Greg Little. It's do they want it? These are guys that just – they have it. They have the tools to be good. They have all the physical ability, but do they really want it? And, you know, he, he does not look like he's very strong, does not look like he can can do a lot of things, whether it's reach blocking or down blocking, very little control more times than not. And he has very little grip strength, which is key to me. Like, Jawan Taylor has some of the best, the best 
grip strength in the class. Um, and then just when your hand placement is inconsistent and you have mediocre grip strength, I don't see how you can always instantly have to go to recovery mode and then you can't really recover because you don't have the hand strength to do it. So these are things that just like you look at and you see and you're like, I don't, I don't see it. And, and CP Christian Page, who's a, a also a national scout at Cover One, we've talked about it a couple of times, and we just believe that this guy, sure, sure, top seventy-five prospect, absolutely. But realistically, I'm not touching him until late second round, uh, maybe third round. So Jesus. that's that's where I would value him. How the mighty have fallen. Now, value. <laughs> you want to now see? Here's probably I'm probably going to get the opposite answer from you because again heading into the season this collegiate season I thought Greg Little was going to be the guy and he yeah. he wasn't really and then he hasn't tested out since then you know after the season stopped and so that's kind of precipitated this fall I guess when I look at the Oklahoma offensive line now these are guys who came into the season you didn't hear a whole lot of buzz and then as an offensive line that entire crew came out. And I get it. You know, they won the award for the nation's best collegiate offensive line. They got a ton of love from the draft community. My question is, is all of these these accolades and these glowing drafted pre-draft reviews and things of that nature, is this warranted or not? Are they, all of these guys the real deal? Because what the, the reason I ask this question we as Bills fans have sat here and year over year over year watched Tom Brady. Now, I'm not saying Kyler Murray is Tom Brady. But what I'm saying is I've watched a very good quarterback make mediocre offensive lines look fantastic simply because he's a good quarterback. He, he, and so in that way, is it possible that Kyler Murray made this group look better than they are? Or is the, are these guys the goods, I guess is what I'm wondering. No, they're the goods, man. They're, they're center. Uh, his name escapes me right now. God, I can't remember his name. But uh, the guy's got the potential to be a future first-round pick um, in next year's draft or the year after that. I think he might have been a true freshman. Um, I cannot remember. But uh, he was certainly a player that stood out, and every single time you watch him, he's just a mean little shit. And then you get to, like, Drew Samaya, and you get to Ben Powers on the interior. Ben Powers, just a country boy, country strong. And this is a guy that, that can play left guard. He makes things look easy. I love the way he operates in space and some of the times that he, he takes the, the right angle to do things, whether it's at the second level or pulling down the line of scrimmage. Drew Samia, Samaya, however the hell you say his name, he is a guy that just has so much, I think, power behind his punch, but he plays with one of the nastiest mean streaks of any player in this class outside of maybe Dalton Risner. And... Um, then you got at right tackle Cody Ford, who has some very good footwork, very clean on his lower body, at times can play a little high. I love his grip strength as well. And then you have Bobby Evans, who has, you know, not the not the tallest guy in the world at 6'4", but he's got almost 35-inch arms. So, like, he's kind of shaped differently. And, he, and people have said, plug him in and play guard. But, like, with 35-inch arms, I think you could still play him at, at left tackle or even right tackle. And he's a player that's very well in the consideration for probably top 125 of, of this class of offensive linemen. Um, I, I like that, you know, he, he's a, and he's a guy that gets forgotten about a lot or forgotten about a lot because of his ability to um, – his hand placement is relatively good. I, again, I, I love the, the grip strength with him. His overall strength is really good. I think there's times that he looks a little stiff um, and is sometimes lost in space sometimes. And that just simply means when he goes out and he pulls and he's heading towards the sideline, he's not necessarily getting a blocker. And there's times that his body's not really under control. But overall, yes, this group is for real. All five of them were legit. And I think all you know the four that are in this class, which is in, pretty impressive, four starting oh, yeah. offensive linemen in one draft class, and probably all four are going to get picked in the top 125, maybe top 150 of this draft, uh, worst case scenario. And I, I think uh, I think it's legit. And I, I again, I wouldn't be surprised if if the Bills, if they didn't take Andre Dillard and they break our hearts and they take DK Metcalf, um, they go ahead and they they take. <laughs> I love the look on your face. And then they take. Uh, <laughs> and then they take. Uh, you know, one of these Oklahoma offense alignments. So we'll see how they go about it. But I, I love this group uh, as a whole, and the OU guys are, are for real. Was it a Creed Humphrey you were talking about with Oklahoma? That's the that's the freaking guy right there, the Creed Humphrey. His name is Creed. I don't know. Named yeah. after Scott Stapp. I just, whenever anybody says Creed, I just think <laughs> of Creed Bratton. 
from The Office, and I just picture him being kind of weird. Like, you're just a weird dude, man. <laughs> oh, body. Cool. Oh, body. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, I, I mean, I guess to your point, that's insane to have a school field that field that kind of offensive line talent to a single draft. I mean, I don't yes. know that I've ever heard of anything like that, which is what, what prompted the question. And I guess that also makes me question what Kyler Murray's prospects are. If scouts see the offensive line play and they say, well, Kyler's good, but he also had arguably one of the best crop of offensive linemen playing together that we've seen in a long time at the NCAA level, there's no guarantee he's going to get that in the NFL. So well, There's I, a reason why he's 26th on my board. Now, Kyler Murray, I, he's a different player, different dynamic. I know Kyler Murray's not even really a player that we want to talk about, but I'm going to just hash this care. out because hey. I, I, I agree with you in the sense that – or maybe you didn't really make this point, but you asked the question, so I'm answering it. And it's <laughs> – he, he, he played behind a very, very good offensive line. And think about this. This is now being rumored for a couple of weeks now. He's going to go first overall. He's going to play in a new system, an air raid offense that certainly he knows. But he's going to go play behind an offensive line that was awful last year. Absolutely dreadful. Do you know that they and, only paid $2 million? I bagged on the Bills for cheaping out because they paid our starters last year $12 million <laughs> for the whole line. I mean, Taylor Lewan makes more than everybody who played on our offensive line combined. So here I am pissed off thinking we have to be the worst in the NFL. And I pull up Spotrack and I start looking at the salaries. Their starters last season, who started the, the most, most of the games, the bulk of the games, made $2 million. Unbelievable. That's <laughs> awful. There's, ki- there's kickers out there that make more than that. But you fired your coach. You as a GM exactly. not only assembled that line, then you threw a rookie quarterback behind it and then fired your coach when it didn't work. So, And then they're going to do it again. So th- that's my point, I guess, is when I look at this whole Kyler Murray thing, I'm thinking, number one pick, you're going to put him on Arizona. That's expecting the same results. I almost feel like when you're talking about this offensive line class that has been saving his ass for the last calendar year, and now he's going to go to a team that has the worst offensive line situation anybody's ever seen. You can't fix that in one draft. You can't. No, you can't. And it, it, like, it, like if you blew it up after one year with Josh Rosen, who was my top quarterback last year and is only 22 right now, I mean, if you're going to blow that up after just one year – and then you're going to go get a guy that has incredible risk behind him, not just because of size, but, I mean, yeah, very accurate with the football, but he looks to go deep down the field far too often for my liking. Um, and, again, the size is a problem. But he played for a very good offensive line, not going to get that treatment in the NFL. And if the if the secret gets out on him and he's playing behind that offensive line, I mean, dude, best of luck to you. And also, by the way, you're not playing against Big 12 air raid defenses anymore in no, Texas Tech. No. You're playing against some of the best defensive players in the world. And I just, I don't know. I, I don't see this working out the best way. Um, but for the OU offensive line, again, as we reiterate back to that, I think that is a very good group of guys. And um, Kyler Murray, we'll see, man. I don't know. I, God I don't bless feel him. confident about it. God bless him. Cheers to him. Hey, Chris. Here's to Kyler Murray. <laughs> Hope, hopefully, for his safety, he doesn't end up with the Arizona Cardinals. So, oh, he's he's going there, but best nah. of luck to you, Kyle. <laughs> so we just got done talking about a lot of tackles. We've kind of been because obviously they get the, they get all the press. You know what I mean? Offensive yeah. tackles are sexy when you talk about the offensive line. That's the position where everybody's looking and they go, "Oh, well, who do you have at right tackle? Who do you have left tackle? You know, you got to stop pass rushers." The inside, I mean, I, I like to think, because I used to play guard, and I, I like to think of the guys who work on the inside of the offensive line. They do the dirty work. I mean, that's the yeoman's work going on right there. So your top three interior offensive linemen in this class, who do you have, let's say, your top three? Uh, Garrett Bradbury is my top interior offensive lineman. I've got him listed as a center. He's, he's at 12th overall. Um, on the big board. I like him a lot for a zone blocking offense. I love his ability to reach block. I, I think he struggles a little bit to anchor. A lot of that's because he's only about 305 pounds. 
Um, and that might be on a good day, and that's maybe through draft season. There's times that I think he, like on film, he looked like he was about maybe 300 if we're lucky. Um, but again, a very physical player, plays with the nasty side. I love that. I love his ability in space. I love his ability to chip and get to the second level and, and the angles that he takes to get to that um, to that level. And then Chris Lindstrom out of Boston College, he's 30th on my board. He's my second-ranked interior offensive lineman. I love the the, the just overall tools that this guy has. He's a, he's a leader. He's kind of like a pro's pro. It's almost like he's already been in the league for a couple of years is how it feels. Um, I, I think he'd be a terrific fit for a team like Green Bay. He's another player that I think, similar to Bradbury in a sense, that he could uh, run in, in and out of zone uh run blocking concepts and schemes like that. But I think he could also establish himself in a power uh, running scheme. But overall, I, I like his ability in space. I like his ability, again, to get to the second level. There's a lot of times that he gets up to, to middle linebackers and, and takes them and fights them with ease. He's got really good grip strength. Um, so just overall, really good player. And then the, the next player is Eric McCoy um, out of Texas a and He's 47th on my board. This guy is just thick. He really stood out at the senior bowl. And when I say thick, I mean he's got tree trunks for legs. And, again, what offensive lineman doesn't? But it really stands out with him. Grip strength is there. He's nasty. I, I love him as a center. I think a team in the second round that's looking for, for a center uh, would be really beneficial to take him. And I think he's a top 50 pick in the draft. So those are my top three. See, Chris, I, I feel like the, I, see, I like talking about guys who just their job is to go out there and maul people. That's it. Exactly. We're, playing, we're, we're going out there. It's every snap you're in somebody's face. You hit a man on every play. I like that. Well, if you're like me, you don't, you don't like you don't know what's happening with the interior line this year because you don't see anybody in anybody's board that's on the level of Nelson from Indianapolis. <laughs> just, <laughs> That dude is, mauled. Is there anybody? That's true. I was going to say, no, is there uh, anybody with that kind of kill? Because that guy, he is. I I, I laughed at first because I was like, oh, guards. You drafted a guard that high? And then I watched him just just wreak havoc on the AFC South. <laughs> yeah, I've never had an offensive line. I mean, granted, I've only really been doing like big boards for two years, but – I've never seen an offensive lineman like him, like as far as a guard. And he was my top ranked player last year. And I just, uh, he's, he's something else, man. I don't even know how to like explain it. He's like a, a mad dad finding his daughter in a phone booth or something. Like, it's just I, like, does that make sense? No, does, yeah. I get it. It's, it's literally, you watched him mow people down and it yeah. was, it was just a disregard for life itself. Like the man would <laughs> stroll through the defense, just I watched him just kind of dis he disengaged from a defensive end that he's already kind of shoved off to the tackle. He's working to the second level, and there's this there's a linebacker who's just caught completely unaware, and it's like yeah. in slow motion you watch the linebacker and he knows the exact moment he's fucked. <laughs> and, yeah. and 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 it was one of those things where Nelson didn't have to bury him, but he did. Exactly. He'd bury yeah, him anyway, yeah. and then move on looking for somebody else to hit. So, yeah, so there's none or, of that this year. <laughs> No, I don't. Th I mean, I don't think. So. I mean, like as far as like nastiness, guys that are gonna actually like teabag you. Um, <laughs> Garrett Garrett Bradbury is one of those guys for sure. Okay. Uh, Risner's for sure one of those guys, but they're just not as clean as as Quentin Nelson was. I mean, mm -hmm. like you can you could have like Nelson was just. Oh, he's a freak. He was. Yeah, he's just a bad dude, man. It's <laughs> he's fucking great. I'm reminded of that old uh, Bruce Smith. Bad things, man. <laughs> bad things. You could say the same thing about Quentin Nelson. So now as we move to talking about the Buffalo Bills. Now, Chris and I just talked our listeners' ears off for a few minutes about our situation. And I think that despite our team's free agency acquisitions, when you look at it, offensive line has got to be a strong consideration for the Bills this year. Especially when you look at the strength of the class, the overall quality of the tackles, the quality of the interior players, the contract situations that are at play. Uh, yeah. the, the the lack of starts at some key positions for the guys that we've brought on. I mean, with with that in mind, are there any players here specifically, let's say outside of the first round, that you think might make a fit not only for the scheme we run, but philosophical value when we hit draft day? Well, if they if they take DK Metcalf in round one. Um, <laughs> the more you say it, the, I, I swear to God, I, 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 I reflexively reach for a beer when you say that. 
I mean, it's Jesus. What are you doing, Amir? I'm, I'm enjoying the show. Uh, <laughs> and so, no, like in the second round, it, I would have to say Caleb McGarry out of Washington. I, I think he's certainly a player that would fit their mold. Uh, he's he's certainly a right tackle. Um, I think maybe he's got a little bit of a higher upside as a guard, uh, simply because he's got shorter arms. He constantly exposes his chest a little bit too much. But he's one of those guys that I think operates very smoothly in space. I love his ability to chip and, and get to the second level. Um, and I, I think he's got, a, 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 like, it's hard to explain. Like, anchoring is there, and but there's times that he gets beat with speed rushes, like, pretty bad. But at the same time, he's, like, at the line of scrimmage and the block recognition that he has there is, like, not the best I've seen, but it's consistent and it's okay. like his ability, like his ability to basically like how I'm trying to explain it with Caleb McGarry is like he plays nasty, but he's also got this ability to like work with tight ends and guards, like his ability to work with the guys that are around him. He doesn't necessarily like maul you, but he knows and he understands that the combo block is coming. He understands that the tight end is chipping off. Like he understands the responsibilities of the other offensive linemen. So he helps make the offensive linemen around him better. See, that's and, huge. Uh, that in and of itself is huge because it's rare right. that a and, kid coming out of college has that level of understanding out of the gate. Exactly. And like, he's got such an awesome story too off the field. Like, uh, his family basically lived in an RV because there was a house fire. And there's like, there's a, I don't want to get too deep into it because of time and everything, but like very much uh, interesting story. So when you get some time, check it out. I know Eric uh, from cover one definitely put out a phenomenal piece on uh, just offensive line play. And he used a ton of uh, uh, McGarry clips and everything. He's 56th on my board. So I, I think he's certainly a guy on the second day of the draft that the bills should strongly consider, considering that they've, I think had 13 or 14 official visits with offensive linemen. So, well, exactly. Now in terms <laughs> of busts, it's the thing everybody's worried about with every draft pick. And it's the thing that we fans beat each other up about. I mean, I stay out of it, but you open, you open a Facebook and you go to any fan group or you go to Twitter and you see somebody who put, has the balls to put their you know big meaties on the chopping block and say, hey, I think we should take this guy. And then you're going to have the chorus of a thousand people who say, boo, boo this man. Oh, that guy's a bust. He's terrible, even though they don't know anything. I mean, exactly. <laughs> they don't know anything. We, are, we as Bills fans are well-versed in busts or at least being sold a fake bill of goods. I mean, Mike Williams? Anybody? Anybody. Mike what? But at the same time, people <laughs> hated on Orlando Brown last year, who had the quote-unquote worst combine of all time. And yet now he's firmly entrenched as the starting right tackle of the Baltimore Ravens. Yep. Is there anybody in this draft that you see as a candidate to get overdrafted just because of their physical stature or because they're like a Mike Mamula. They're the workout warrior at the Combine who shoots up draft boards, gets overdrafted, never lives up to the hype. Who who are a couple candidates that you think fit that bill? Uh, well, I mean, Kyler Murray, first overall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, not like from the workout warrior standpoint, I'm going to say Brian Burns. Um, I've been very much on the – the wagon of indifferent on him. I I coached the defensive line position at the high school level for six years. And this is a, a position that I don't just like watch to watch. Like I, I watch it because I love it. And it's a position that I, I don't know more than the next guy, but I know relatively enough to say, okay, this is a guy that is okay. This is a guy that's not okay. And when I watch him, the first thing I look for is work ethic. And it's there when he wants it to be there. And at the same time, it's not there. Um, and he's a player that played probably anywhere between 230, 235 from the, the reports all season long. He checks into the combine at 249. Ooh. Absolutely, absolutely crushed the combine, absolutely, which is shocking. But until I actually see like a picture of him like on a scale before a game at 249 and playing in a game at 249, I can't believe he's that great because he struggles against the run, in my opinion. 
He does a, a good job engaging on blocks, but if the play's away from him, He's not going to always disengage and run upfield in pursuit of the football, which is a big concern to me because mm-hmm. you need to you need to show me that you not only have the bend and the pass rush ability, but you need to show me that you have the bend and the want and the motor. Well, that's the to crazy thing to me. And, and people here have been talking him up for a while, and I know that you mm-hmm. love the defensive and offensive line play. I'm a guy who I sit as a season ticket holder. Ask Chris. My focus. I'm never watching wide receivers. When the ball gets snapped, my eyes are glued in the pocket. And yeah. the where our season tickets are, we have essentially what is the all-22 view. We look right down the field, straight down the pipeline. So when the ball gets snapped, I'm watching the offensive line play. I'm watching the defensive line. I'm watching the quarterback in the pocket because to me that's what's important. With mm-hmm. a guy like Brian Burns, my my biggest fear is I remember back to Aaron Mabin. You know, Bills, he's been getting yeah. a lot of press here in regards to the Bills. The Bills had him in for a visit. The Bills are interested. I'll tell you what. Anytime you take a guy who's under 260 pounds and you put him near the defensive line, offensive line, I get scared. Because you're talking about a guy who, I mean, I think the most recent example of that is the kid out of, oh, there's a kid he was just taken. I remember the name. Oh, Arizona drafted him. What is his name? He They took him... uh, Temple. Hassan Reddick. T- Hassan Reddick. So they took him, and he was a guy who, in my head, I said, okay, he's small. And everything he mm-hmm. did, he has to learn nuance to now because he's not just going right. to win with power because he doesn't have yeah. it. And he's slowly finding his way, which is encouraging. But he's an outlier. When you look at all of the small defensive players who have ever been asked to creep up to the line and try to be a factor. So right. with guys like Burns, I immediately cringe. When I see that. So before we let you go, I want to pick your brain about two sp- very specific prospects. One of them I like, one of them confuses the hell out of me, and maybe you can make hay of both. First of all, offensive guard Ross Pierce Baker, senior out of Alabama. The guy has SEC pedigree. He's, again, much like Greg Little, some of the best defensive line talent, and he's multifaceted. He's played a lot of different positions. I think he's better in the run game than against pass rush because he doesn't really have a whole lot of technique. He's not very refined. But I don't know. I watch him, and he's been great to watch. He's been one of the constants among Alabama year in and year out. So, I mean, I'd argue he's better than where a lot of analysts see him. But then again, I don't scout for shit. So <laughs> so <laughs> what do you think about Ross Pierce Baker in terms of his NFL prospects and where do you think he might fall in this year's draft? Well, you know, I've seen him with his ability like like his overall athletic profile and he's like a like a pretty thick dude. And at 6'4", 307, thick guy, but he's got short arms at 32 and an eighth. Um, but he only and he only had 20 reps in the bench, which kind of scares me. I know like okay, 225, whatever, you're not repping that, you know, 20 times in a game, like at one time. But um, I think he needs to get a little bit better with like overall strength. And I think he needs to show that with like overall grip strength and ability to when he recovers and like disengages and reengages, how is that overall strength? Um, But I think moving laterally, he's relatively well. I think he's a decent pass blocker. Um, I like his ability to move up and down and around the line of scrimmage. Um, so I, I definitely think he's got a, a chance to, to play, um, at, whether it's center or guard. Uh, again, versatility is always key for me when I'm watching guys. And if you have that versatility, you move up my board a little bit. Um, but he's certainly just a guy that I think needs a little bit more time as far as developing. Um, I like him a lot more than the kid that we talked about last year out of Alabama, the center that they had last year. Um, can't remember his name, but uh, I like him a little bit more than that guy. Um, and I just think overall he's you know a, a player in probably two, three years that we're talking about on a team starting offensive line. So All right. And then one guy who, I mean, I, I don't know anything about him, but the Bills seem to because they've scouted him both the Senior Bowl, they've sent scouts to Alabama State while he was playing, and they've also hosted him as one of their 30 formal visits, and that's offensive tackle Titus Howard out of Alabama State. Kid's massive. He's touted as being athletic, but I've seen him ranked anywhere from the fourth round to the seventh round, depending on who you follow. Where do you have him going? 
Well, I have, he's one of the few offensive tackles that I have not watched yet. Um, but at 6'5", 322 is what he checked in at the combine with. Almost had 11-inch hands, which is freakishly huge. Um, he tested really well. He had a 29-and-a-half-inch vertical. You don't see um, it, but Chris is going hand size because he knows that that blows my mind. I hate it. I hate the hand size conversation. I want to smash my face <laughs> off the wall. I mean, it's. I think it's important, but I mean, I, I could get into it, but I know, you know <laughs> we're crunched against time here. But um, I know Eric from Cover One was watching him. Christian Page from uh, Cover One as well. Were, they were both watching him, and they really like uh, some of the things. Some of the things that they were telling me was with his pass sets. Uh, he was, you know, aggressive at times. Looked very smooth at times. Um, but at times he also lost the battle. So he's one of the few guys that I've actually had requests to to watch. So I'm going to take a look at him probably in the next week or two. Um, definitely before I probably won't get like a grade on him, so he probably won't be on my overall big board. That's but, fine. Uh, That's fine. But yeah, so, I, I, so if and when you do review him, where can our listeners go to find your work on him? Not only on him, but on the rest of your draft prep. Uh, just go to Twitter at Russ NFL Draft. Uh, that is the, the place that you need to be um, all the time. Just like me, that's where all the video content is, the the podcast posts, uh, articles that I write, everything. Um, so. Yeah, Twitter's a good spot, at Russ NFL Draft. Yeah, once again, that's at Russ NFL Draft on Twitter. That dude really knows his uh, his offensive line, and I have to bring it back to this from way earlier in the show. This, this beer that Kyle got us from Vegas. I'm not an IPA guy, and you know that through and through. How many times have I been over to your place, and you're like, oh, you here, refuse. Here, I try offer that. you one, and you shoot me down. It's, it's, this thing goes down super smooth. Uh, Kyle, I don't know where you found this thing, but I mean, it's Acropolis, and there's a picture of Zeus on the front of the can. <laughs> this thing was brewed by the gods, sir. I mean, it's <laughs> it's one of the smoothest double IPAs I've ever had, and we can't get that here. No, sadly, <laughs> it's only you could probably only get it locally in and around Nevada, in specifically Reno, where it's brewed. Kyle, once again, thank you so much, and then. I guess thank you to Sam Gold for letting us use use his audio. Guys, I'm telling you, Jonah Williams is one of my favorite prospects. I, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about him. I got wildly soundtrack, sidetracked <laughs> during this entire draft conversation because Dillard just came out of nowhere and then the conversation yeah, the guy that started Russ to was, flow. That's a guy Russ was high on. But I'm urging you guys to go check out the guy that I'm probably highest on, which is Jonah Williams. Link in the description to the show to a complete breakdown on his game. I still think he's one of the better tackles in this class. And then CoverOne.net to see the rest of Brown's work. It, again, I, we very much appreciate him giving us his time. Guys, great beer, great conversation. That's what makes a great podcast, but we got to get the hell out of here. If I don't talk to you again, if I'm somehow lost at sea like Gilligan, I just want some of you to know, and you know who you are, I never liked you people anyway. (laughs) And with that, I'm Drew Gear. that's Chris Krueger, and this has been the Rock Pile Report.